Tonight on City News Connect. Bella had a really big heart. Still waiting for justice. The mother of murder victim Bella Rose de Rosier speaks out. A sentencing for her daughter's killer is delayed, finding support from an unlikely source. We lost everything in a matter of minutes. The ex-wife of the killer shares the impact of the horrific crime on her life and why she's supporting Bella's brigade. As the clock ticks closer to the four-year anniversary of the horrific murder of an Edmonton child, her family is still waiting for her killer's final court date. Sentencing recently hit with delays. I'm Carly Robinson and welcome to City News Connect. The mother of Bella Rose de Rosier sitting down with me for her first interview on the trial since it began, telling me she now has a strength to help others navigate trauma in the justice system. Another one just of uh, me pregnant with her little sister. She had so much love and loved her little sister so much. Each picture a memory. <laughs> These are her hip hop days. Um, Bella had a, a short but um, beautiful little dance career. Uh, her last recital performance, she told me that she was going on a sabbatical from dance. <laughs> And that, and that she would return in a few years. Of a bold little girl. Like, Bella loved to sing, Bella loved to play the piano, um, always humming, singing and dancing. Um, this would be um, a picture of her, um, the, uh, the last year of her life. But Melissa Francis says above all else, seven-year-old Bella Rose de Rosier, a loving big sister who only wanted to help others before her future was taken away. For people who, who didn't have the pleasure of knowing Bella, can you tell us a little bit more about her and what you want her legacy to be? Bella had a really big heart and um, her dream was just in the year after losing her father um, to suicide, her dream was to do something in regards to mental health. Um, she had a big heart, she loved everything, love, um, butterflies, hearts, fairies, all those things. She would just dance and sing around the house and she was just very special. She had a huge smile and she just had, like I said, big dreams to help those that went through the same thing that she went through, which is, you know, unexpected tragic loss. Melissa Francis proudly wearing her daughter's name on her sleeve. T-shirts for Bella's Brigade, a way to raise funds for an upcoming mental health retreat so she can continue her eldest daughter's goal of helping others after her own tragedy. May 18th, 2020 was the day everything changed as Melissa tucked her two girls into bed suddenly needing to fight off a man attacking her oldest daughter with scissors. The killer, David Michael Moss, a family friend Melissa was trying to help after he shared with her his suicidal thoughts and delusions. Moss immediately arrested. We know that the murder took place, but what we don't know is what happened. Telling police he killed Bella. I didn't want to do it either, right? Of course I didn't want to do this. This is all, it was like a... Saying he'd gone through a spiritual awakening that he needed to act out his fears. A selfless, a selfless act. Shortly after being arrested, David Michael Moss was transferred to the Alberta Hospital Edmonton, where doctors agreed he was likely in a psychosis at the time of the homicide, which began a lengthy court process of determining whether or not he could be held criminally responsible for his actions. Under the criminal code, some offenders can be sent to the medical system rather than the justice system if they meet two thresholds to be declared not criminally responsible. In this case, Moss failed both. In Justice Manziak's 38-page decision, where he found Moss guilty of second-degree murder in April, he pointed to evidence that showed Moss understood the consequences and morality of his actions, telling police there was a murder and he liked it following his arrest, and saying likely his psychosis was not a disease of the mind, because the majority of doctors who testified believed Moss's psychosis was cannabis-induced. 
Pointing to evidence, he increased his use of a THC vape pen at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, when his tattoo shop was suddenly closed. And that's when he became increasingly paranoid, suddenly stopping his cannabis use in the days leading up to Bella's death. The increased use and withdrawal, both likely factors, according to doctors. For Melissa, that guilty verdict led to a new waiting game. Supposed to read a victim impact statement in court February 16th for sentencing. Now delayed until May 10th, just eight days before the fourth anniversary of losing her daughter. Very triggering and just, again, perpetuating, you know, flashbacks of PTSD and just ruminating about not being able to trust people and with every court date that's adjourned or these kinds of things happen my lack of trust is just growing stronger and stronger um, not only myself but also my youngest daughter too so um, just more worry while she's at school um, the teacher mentioning how she's a lot more anxious um, it impacts us in a, in a really big way um, I've taken a leave off of work and now I'm kind of just working on myself and kind of you know getting better so I can prepare for the the new date um, which is going to be three months from now so ahead on City News Connect what's behind the delay and why Melissa feels the need to speak out and still to come I was looking for how how do I even tell my children the ex-wife of the killer shares her perspective with every court date that's adjourned or these kinds of things happen, my lack of trust is just growing stronger and stronger. Imagine feeling forced to speak out on the justice system. With these adjournments, it's really hard for me to trust the system, especially given um, my past with, with my PTSD and everything. Melissa Francis feels waiting for her daughter's final court date is prolonging trauma for all those involved. Originally scheduled for mid-February, just one week before, suddenly learning it was pushed back three months. I had a, a huge team of supporters, of family and friends that were going to be attending that day. Um, you know, plan to take the day off also well in advance because that date was made over eight months ago. Um, and so I'm really trying to plan my life accordingly, even with it being difficult, um, with the trauma and grief always flooding in and out of my life. Um, but it's really hard to move forward with having these huge setbacks constantly. Since David Michael Moss was found guilty of second degree murder in April 2023, He's changed lawyers. His new lawyer not agreeing to an interview as the case is still before the courts, but tells me Moss is waiting on what's called in court a glad you report. The report is required for Indigenous offenders. It's supposed to give a judge an overview of systemic challenges the offender may have experienced before the crime. But Moss's new lawyer says the glad you report wasn't ready because of a clerical error. It doesn't sit well with me. Melissa understands the document is necessary in the Canadian justice system, but struggles to trust a simple error could be made on such a crucial report, given the date was set eight months ahead of time. They filed it on February 1st, I understand, um, which is just very unacceptable to me because I, I feel like there needs to be some accountability in following up in some time frames before that, not just a couple of weeks maybe a couple of months even. Um, if the Gladue report takes four to eight weeks to prepare, I would assume that you would, you know, put a reminder in to check maybe two or three months before to make sure that it's set for that due date. Like if you were to be going to university and you have a due date, you need to meet that due date, right? So I, I consider it all, all the same. There needs to be some sort of accountability um, and I don't feel like there really has been. Three months from now and, and it's going to be a week and a bit shy of the anniversary of the crime, the murder of your daughter. Um, how do you prepare for that? I don't know. <laughs> um, I just kind of just, you know, one, one moment at a time, one day at a time, just, you know, one fraction of a second at a time, basically. Um, it's, it's really hard to know that, yeah, um, you know, like, a, a, again, finding out just a week and a half short, um, that it's going to be extended and then and then finding out that it's another three months it's just this constant waiting game um 
you know, waiting to have some sort of closure. I, you know, I don't feel that we're ever really going to have legitimate actual closure or justice with this, but we need some sort of answers. Um, and, and my daughter needs answers, you know, um, just for her to feel safe and secure. Do you have confidence that May 10th will be the day? I really don't, unfortunately. Um, and that's why I'm kind of, you know, fighting this fight um, and let it be known what goes on um, with victims. Um, victims are kind of constantly victimized. Um, not only are we a victim at the time of the crime, we're a victim, I would say, for life um, in regards to PTSD. And then the secondary victimization from just having to deal with the judicial system and these adjournments and what goes on. The fact the legal system is not set up for victims, true, according to law professor Gerard Kennedy. Certainly in civil procedure, there's a fairly equal treatment of the plaintiff and the defendant. In criminal procedure, the system is really built around the rights of the accused, and there are good reasons for that. There are asymmetric consequences for the accused compared to uh, the people who have been uh, affected by the crime. At the same time, that doesn't make it any easier for those who've been affected by the crime. Professor Kennedy says there have been improvements in recent years, but the pace of justice can feel slow when compared to popular culture and other countries. And generally, the system is facing delays from more complex cases and a shortage of judges. It's even worse in civil. Uh, it takes about four years to go to a civil trial in the King's Bench in Alberta, whereas in criminal, they try very hard to get them done in 30 months. They don't always succeed, but they usually do. For Melissa, deciding to launch Bella's Brigade, sharing the impact of the delays on her family, a way to fight for change. Very flawed. Our system is very flawed. It needs a lot of work. It needs a lot of help. It needs a lot of advocacy. It needs a lot of fight. And um, usually when things have happened to people, um, you know, they want to they want to see change. Um, but they don't have the strength to make that happen. Um, so I finally have the strength to make that happen and I'm gonna make it happen. Next on City News Connect. It was as if I was watching everybody around me live and we were stuck. The ex-wife of David Michael Moss speaks out. It's not often when covering court, we hear from the family of someone guilty of murder. But the now ex-wife of David Michael Moss, guilty in the second degree murder of seven-year-old Bella Rose de Rosier, is sharing her perspective, saying she feels multiple systems failed, the young girl and her family. So Tracy, just to start, if you can tell me why you felt the need to join Bella's Brigade. You're wearing the t-shirt today. Why is this so important? I believe it should only be about Bella. And as a human, as a mother, a sister, a friend, I think standing behind that family is what everybody should be doing. Tracy Couture Starotza's life was forever altered May 18th, 2020, when her then husband killed Bella, needing to try and explain to their four children. The first few months it was walking in a cloud pretty much. Um, it was as if I was watching everybody around me live and we were stuck and we couldn't understand and you know, I was trying to deal with my own emotional stress, but then watching my children and trying to help them get what they needed. Now living out of province, she still has to come back to Edmonton to read a victim impact statement, a step she wants to take for Bella, despite needing to relive trauma. It's almost as if that whole day plays out again and the PTSD and the no sleeping, like I don't think I've slept all of this month because I was preparing for this day. In the days leading up to Bella's murder, Tracy called police. Her husband was talking about murdering her and committing suicide as he shared delusions of an awakening. I wasn't in the capacity to help him. I wasn't a professional. I didn't know how to help him. So I reached out to somebody who I thought 
okay, you, you're trained, you're professionals, you know how to deal with this. You can help me, please. And when I say that, I begged, I begged them to help. I did everything. I cried and pled and just please help. The morning of Bella's murder, May 18th, 2020, the Edmonton Police Crisis Response Team met with Moss, later telling court he didn't meet the criteria to be apprehended under the Mental Health Act. That's when Bella's mother, Melissa, stepped in as a family friend, a nurse, and someone who recently lost her husband to suicide. They walked away and they left him. And then, bless Melissa's soul, she stepped in because she did not want another family to go through what her family went through, okay? She thought, you know what? If they're not going to help, I'll help. And so that's where my guilt comes in because she took it upon herself to want to do better when there was a system designed for that and they walked away from us. And, you know, going through the, the trial and listening to those professionals speak on it, it just, they found no grounds to apprehend. They found no reason to... I just wonder, what does it take? Believing this latest delay in sentencing is pushing off accountability. People always say, like, what more can we do? But the biggest thing is just stand behind each other, you know, make it loud. And it, Melissa and I had talked and, you know, it's true. We, we have to be loud now. We have to be loud or we are not heard. And that makes no sense. When you think of justice, how does that make any sense? When you think of the system, how does it make sense that we have to stand up and scream and cry and, you know, rally just to be heard? Next on City News Connect. Just in the year after losing her father um, to suicide, her dream was to do something in regards to mental health. Continuing a little girl's legacy of helping others. In the days following Bella Rose de Rosier's horrific murder, as teddy bears piled up outside her Mill Woods home, her mother shared a prepared statement with reporters. It is in the arms of all that we can put one foot in front of the other. In honor of Bella, hold your loved ones tighter and bring love into all that you do. Announcing donations to a fundraising page would go to charities, including those supporting victims of crime, because Bella loved to give back. And now her little sister continuing her annual lemonade stand in support of the local children's hospital. Even the year after Bella's passing, having the Edmonton-wide event dedicated to Bella. Now, three and a half years later, Melissa and her new husband want to do more to fill gaps she experienced in supports. I really had to honestly seek out, seek out my own supports, a lot of them being private. Thankfully, I have benefits now. Um, but for those that don't have benefits, um, you know, or, or aren't able to advocate for themselves or aren't able to navigate the system, I think it's very difficult to move forward. Um, and I think there's a lot of people that aren't able to move forward at all because of that. Um, so I've been able to navigate the system a little bit and find, you know, cost efficient ways um, to, to grow and learn tools, but it's definitely lacking. Fundraising through a tattoo event and selling Bella's Brigade t-shirts to host a Butterfly Hearts mental wellness retreat this summer, put on by the same counselor who helped her and her youngest, Lily. She runs Power Psychology and I, I can't thank her enough for what she was able to do for me and my daughter in moving forward and I want to be able to provide the same uh, for others. So the retreat is kind of a bit of a start to be able to provide a safe space for people to be vulnerable, um, to learn some new tools, um, you know, for their trauma. Because the, I mean, the fundraiser, the retreat, that seems like it's first steps. Yeah, that it definitely is first steps. We have kind of bigger dreams um, and hopes and I'm, hope, I'm hoping that we'll be able to follow through with those and maybe providing funding for things such as uh, supports, uh, counseling supports in court. Um, that's been a really major thing for me is having my counselor there for all of my court dates. Uh, it's been amazing. And um, I was able to have one of the um, service dogs, um, which was actually just 
uh, out of luck because um, my youngest was associated with the zebra society um, but most adults actually don't get a service dog um, which is something i think a lot of people don't know um, but out in power psychology they actually have a service dog themselves so um, and this will be attending with me um, hopefully on May 10th if the, the date follows through. As she waits for the sentencing of David Michael Moss, the man guilty of second degree murder in killing her daughter. What will that moment, sentencing, that last court date, what will that mean for you as well as for Bella's legacy? I think a little bit of closure. Um, we can never have full closure. That would only mean her being able to be back here. Um, and it's really hard for me to say, honestly, because I, I feel like this journey has been never ending. So for, I want it to end, but I just feel like I'm being realistic in that even the sentencing date of May 10th, I'm very aware that there will likely be an appeal. So I'm already trying to mentally prepare myself for that. That's it for City News Connect. Now, just a reminder, if you are struggling with your mental health or thoughts of suicide, Canada recently launched a new three-digit hotline. That's 988. You can call it from anywhere in the country to be connected with supports. I'm Carly Robinson in Edmonton. Have a good night.